generational, and then end with some new thinking by indigenous scholars that my good friend and someone known to many of you, Carol Miller. It's about time to have Carol come back, by the way, in an August time. Okay. So yes, she, she, she always <laughs> tells us the latest stuff that indigenous scholars and writers are doing. And I just want to do a little preview for that at the end. The ongoing definition of trauma is pretty simple. Psychic trauma occurs when a sudden, unexpected, overwhelming, intense, emotional blow or series of blows assaults the person from outside. Traumatic events are external, but they quickly become incorporated into the mind. And that definition is by one of the scholars who's written hugely on trauma. Her name is Lenore Terr, T-E-R-R. -R. Memory, uh, we usually base on words. I mean, I remember when da 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 da. But when overwhelmed by fear and hurt, we lose speech. We just don't know how to say what we're feeling in words. So our system shifts to visual, auditory, olfactory, kinesthetic sensations and feelings. Because there has to be something done to this thing that's happening. And they do not go away, those responses do not go away with time. That's one of the essential things that all of you know about trauma. It just doesn't go away. There's no such thing as closure. I would like to put that word in a bag and put it in the river. Anyway, scholars talk about emotional memory or cellular memory, which is even deeper than emotional. There's just stuff in here that knows that. And what that means then is that we have flashbacks. And all of you deal with flashbacks, I know, when you teach these books. Some of you may deal with flashbacks in your own lives. And a flashback, which is, I think, crucial for your kids to try to understand, a flashback is not a memory. It's a reliving. You're right back where you were when it happened the first time. So, of course, it's what William Faulkner said when he got the Nobel in his famous speech. The past is never over. It's not even past. <clears throat> Where he's doing a play on P-A-S-T, P-A-S-S-E-D. If you want to read somebody who writes absolutely beautifully about this, Sandra Bloom, as in Flyer, has a piece called Trauma Theory Abbreviated. Um, it's a, she's playing with you, it's a long, dense piece, <laughs> but she calls it, I suppose it's because she was going to write a book and then she decided to write a long article instead. Anyway, I, I, I depend on her a great deal. And what she says is, one of her key points, is that what's a crucial for the character or the person is sanctuary, finding some kind of sanctuary. And she talks about physical sanctuary, of course. There need to be some safe places for you. Um, but she also talks about psychological safety. And she says that's the ability to be safe with yourself. Now, I think all these little boxes that we all have, and I do have some now, one or two or three, um, they, they keep us from that ability to be safe with ourselves because you have to slow down. I mean, you, you have to know who yourself is and get in touch with her or him. I mean, you can't just be Googling something all the time. Social safety is ability to find a group, no matter how small, that you feel safe within. Your people, or your clan, or your pod, or whatever it is. And then moral safety, she's very... Um, helpful. Moral safety is the maintenance of a finding and maintaining a value system 
that does not contradict itself or your experience. Those are not easy to come by and very much less easy to come by presently than they were even 10 years ago. She says the most important thing people can do who are with you in your trauma, so it means other characters in the book if you're the writer, is change the question that is asked of the trauma person, the person with the trauma. Don't ask what's wrong with you, ask what happened to you. We see this in the people that are trying to talk about what happens to often black students in, in schools. They misbehave and nobody says what happened to you. Everybody says what's wrong with you and call the cops and get you into the system. If a white student's having a hard day, you're more apt, you're more apt to have somebody ask you what's going on? How, how, how are you? What, what, what? You don't say what's wrong with you. Anyway, I, I, I like Ms. Bloom a lot. She, she's just very helpful. There are two kinds of trauma, personal trauma and historical or intergenerational trauma. Personal trauma happens to me, and it can happen to anyone in the world. It's horrible. It's inexcusable, it's devastating, and it may not be recoverable. There is, however, another level of it that y'all are teaching all these books about, which is historical, which means that it isn't just I, it's that I'm part of a group to whom similar things have been happening for a long time my family, my grandparents, my parents, my grandparents, my great-great-grandparents, my elders, my ancestors. And when that happens, the past is unresolved. So all this stuff gets sort of osmotically often because often the older group doesn't want to talk about it. I mean, think of, think of the, simply, the simplest example. Holocaust survivors who tried desperately not to inflict that on their children or their grandchildren. Soldiers who've been in various wars who come home and won't talk to their wives or husbands or family or anybody. So there's this awful sense of no resolution for the next generation, but yet the next generation somehow understands that the stuff they're enduring on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, century basis has happened to people that look like them, behave like them, believe like them before. Now, one of the things I've been thinking recently in preparation for this talk that I have never thought about quite so clearly is it's a lot easier to be sorry for the individual trauma person Oh, I'm so sorry that happened. How can you help? What can have you talked to so and so? Would you like to such and such? When you're dealing with a person who's part of a historical or intergenerational trauma, it may occur to you, me, that something is wrong with some system. And something might need to be changed. So it's not as easy to cope with you because you're standing for all these other people. You know, in Macbeth, there's that scene where Banquo, where he sees Banquo, and then he keeps seeing endless Banquos. That's what, that's, what, that's what this is like. And so I'm trying to think now about this is something that people who are policy makers, political people, helping people, might need to start thinking about is that the public will not be as forthcoming or relaxed about supporting something for someone who is not only having it happen to her or him, but to lots of other hers and hims that are the same. And maybe that's just something that occurred to me, but it does seem to me it's easier to feel sorry for the individual 
than for the person who's part of a culture. <coughs> now, I'm so happy we talked about earlier um, agents, I mean, how things can be terrible, but also resistance, because the danger for all of us and you with your kids in these books is not to essentialize historical and intergenerational trauma survivors, which means, oh, you're black, so you must be feeling X. Or, oh, you're, you're indigenous, your land was taken away. Oh, no wonder you don't do well in school. No wonder you have a hard time with personal relationships. No wonder, no wonder, no wonder. Well, that is taking away from this, this agency thing that we just had on the board ago. Because I'll bet you that most of the books you're teaching about intergenerational trauma have endless moments, if you find them and help your students find them, where yes, it's horrible, but look what they're doing. Look what they've done. Look what they've made. Look what they've built. Listen to them sing. Watch them quilt. All those kinds of things. So the books you teach show people in those groups clearly damaged, but they find little ways to resist and recover. Um, I, I was thinking recently about personal examples of that. In the early days of second wave <coughs> feminism, some of my scholarly colleagues at the university used to make fun of housewives who, when their husbands went off to work and the kids had gone off to school, went next door still in their bathrobe or nightgown or pajamas and had coffee and talked. And I kept saying, that's a feminist moment. That's a feminist gathering in that kitchen. And some people didn't get what I was trying to get at. And I said it's because they have, they've done the stuff they had to do to get everybody else, their roles, got done. And now they get to sit with each other. And maybe they talk about the weather. I don't care what they're talking about. It's that they have decided to find a, a group that is like them that will give them some kind of support and agency. And I learned from some of those women that sometimes they would talk about how they had burnt the toast before he went to work. <laughs> or over fried the egg. And I thought, that's a feminist act of resistance. <laughs> but I did have trouble getting some of my esoteric women's studies wonderful people. They just had put that in another category with trivia pursuit. So anyway, find ways to resist and recover. Help your students read the text, and any time that's there, do it. For me, the most glaring and marvelous example is in Beloved with Setha and Paul D. Because Paul D has put all of his feelings in that little box that's in his chest. So he only has little tiny feelings, little tiny ones that he can deal with, like how supper, you know. And of course, Setha has a tree on her back which she doesn't know she has, and everything else. But as Morrison develops that relationship between them, it's an amazing thing about finding a way to triumph over enslavement through each other and through touch and through speech. Because Paul D. opens the box, and then he, he, defines for her the tree. He turns the scars into a tree. He makes art on her back. And, and, and I mean, that's just an incredible act of resistance over one of the worst things that can happen is to beat somebody almost to death physically. 
and over and over, it seems to me, that people like Morrison and so many of the people y'all teach. I've, I've said to y'all, some of you before, when we talked about low medicine, your kids say, why are you having us read this book? It's about a drunk slut Indian. Because of what happened, you know, the, the woman who dies at the beginning of the book. And what Carol Miller helped me understand is that what she's trying to do in the snow, hung over and poorly dressed and all the rest of it, is get home, get back to her tribal safety. And so it's a moment of trying, yes, she's dead in the snow, but the point is she got that way doing something agential, even if she did it badly and unsuccessfully. She was doing it with her last breath. That seems pretty amazing to me. And you can think of all the other books that are like that that, that you're teaching. What all this means, of course, is that story is crucial to recovery of any sort from either personal or historical intergenerational. Um, and that's what you teach. You teach stories. Um, what I'm aware of from the people who write about incest theory and, and how those people can begin to feel some agent agency is if you can make something, it doesn't matter what it is, you have you, if, I'm sorry, if you can make something about the event, if you can tell the story of your trauma in some kind of event, some kind of artistic form, and again, it doesn't matter what the artistic form is, but if you can do that, you make it a tiny bit smaller. You have some agency over it. Well, hello. How lovely. Oh my goodness. It's Barb Bursack. We didn't think she could come, and here she is. Oh my goodness. <laughs> well, anyway, hold on, what am I saying? Make it smaller. Make it smaller. Make it smaller. All right. Make art. <laughs> if you can make something of your experience, whatever form, it gets a little bit smaller, and you get a little bit bigger. So what y'all are doing in most of the books you're teaching is helping your students see the ultimate value of writing, since you're teaching writing. If you were teaching dance, then you would be doing steps. If you were teaching music, then you would make, et cetera, et cetera. But you're doing writing. So when people say, what's the value of reading these books? Well, you have a lot of answers. It's to somehow put a shape, put some, put some boundaries around this thing that will not go away and that can overwhelm you again at any moment is that you have you have made something you have made something i recently have come to know something about somebody i didn't know anything about until recently uh, some of you may know somebody she's an australian stand-up comic Hannah Gadsby, is that a name? Oh, I see, I see people nodding their heads. Well, I just discovered her, and I just watched the first of her two amazing, I gather the second one is too, but certainly the first one is called Nanette, N-A-N-E-T-T-E. -E. And in the course of it, she makes a statement that seems to me precisely connected with how to handle intergenerational and historical trauma. She says, there's nothing as amazing, and maybe I've got the wrong word, but th this is almost right. There's nothing as amazing as someone who is broken but has rebuilt herself. And that's what your characters are doing over and over and over. Solar Storm, she's trying to, I mean, I can just name any, all these books you teach. The characters are trying, they are broken, but they are rebuilding or have rebuilt or will rebuild themselves. And so that's what you're showing your students on a meta level, is that any book they read has been somebody's way to put a shape around something that was probably bothering them a lot. 
Now just a few words, just a few words about, oh, no, I'm okay, I'm okay, yeah, here, here. I'm good. Just a few words about current scholarship by black and indigenous authors. There's a wonderful book called The 1619 Project. Some of you probably teach that in part, give it to your students, know about it. That author established a sentence that gets tossed around a lot presently, that 1619 is the, it, that's the enslaving other people beginning in 1619 when the first ship landed wherever it landed, is the beginning of America's original sin. That's a phrase that is just in the atmosphere. And deservedly. What indigenous scholars and some artists are beginning to say is, we absolutely believe that 1619 is the beginning of an American original sin, but there's an older one. When the ship landed and these people hopped out and said, oh, an undeveloped country. We will develop it. But then there were all these millions of people living, oh, things that looked like people. They had two legs, they had arms, they had heads, they had children, they had sex, they had all these things. They're saying we have to talk about two original sins in America. One of them was enslavement, the other one was land appropriation. That what we did, what we did about the land of forcing all these people that were scattered all in all those maps. I'm sure people have that wonderful map that shows you where all the tribal things were and then what happened by 19 something. I mean, they're, you know, little bleeps and thing. What these scholars and artists are saying is that taking the land didn't just deprive them of an address with a house on it because it was the land and their relationship to it that is fundamental to their faith system, their agricultural system, their economic system, to whatever extent it, they had a it barter. You, you would have, this tribe would have a thing to give away everything and then the other tribe would come the next year to your house and get everything. I mean, the land was the basis of their culture. And so to remove them from the land, remove them from their culture. And that is the definition of genocide. And we're having this discussion presently on the five o'clock news, the six o'clock news, the 12 o'clock news, is whether what's happening, and the definition is the same definition, the systematic decision to wipe out a culture. And that's what the land, I think the American government just thought they were taking land. But what people have come to understand is they were taking that whole world culture away from the inhabitants of it. And so that does constitute, and a lot of scholars now, even some white scholars, don't debate that what we've done to Native Americans is genocide. That's what we have done. These same people, the scholars, talk about how they want to, you know, we have these wonderful signs, Black Lives Matter, that you see everywhere. They say the sign for them that would be the comparable sign we could put in our yards, and I hope somebody is making the signs as I speak, is land back. So you put one that says Black Lives Matter, you put another one that says land back. So that's why when the Supreme Court gave part of Oklahoma really recently back to the inheritance of the tribe and it was Justice Kavanaugh who wrote the crucial sentences about that, naming it what it was because he has personal experience with land management. <laughs> that was a huge moment. It doesn't mean, again, that they can have this little plot that now belongs to somebody. It's that the land, as a land 
legal thing is back in the list that belongs to whatever that tribe was. What the, the two scholars that uh, Carol Miller says you have to read are Philip Deloria, he's Van Deloria's son. Some of you may know Van Deloria if you've been reading stuff about older, older scholarship about Native Americans. Philip is his son. So Philip Deloria, D-E-L-O-R-I-A, Deloria. You'll notice I don't have any, uh, I still don't have any strings with the thing. I don't have any, I don't have any of that. So I thought about should I, and I thought no. <laughs> When I first came to the English department a million years ago, a sweet man who wanted to help me found somebody in the, the uh, drama department who was a friend of his, and my colleague said, so-and-so, Professor so-and-so, is willing to meet with you at night and help you lose your southern accent before you teach Milton. <laughs> and I thought, who would I, I mean, who does that be? Who would that be? So I thought, I can't, I, I mean, y'all can do the one and you all know how to do the one. So, anyway. Van Deloria, I mean, Philip Deloria, and then the woman scholar that Carol thinks is even more important, and we'll, it's not a name we know as well, we white people, mostly. But, oh, by the way, um, um, Kalia, you know, our wonderful te teacher, Chong, Chong, Tao Chong, Chong Tao. She's not with us anymore because she's become a very important administrator who will help endless things get done, but we've lost her, and I'm so sorry that we've lost her. She was a wonderful part of our thing for a long time. Anyway, the woman that you need to read is Roxana, spelled Roxana, Dunbar, spelled Dunbar, Ortiz, O-R-T-I-Z. And if you, you, either of them you Google, they'll give you the titles. You can find the titles. They're easy to find. And what those, what both of them are saying is that even in the most traumatized situations, look at what Native Americans have preserved. All the emphasis now on trying to get the languages down, but while there's still somebody alive who can speak the language, and the wonderful efforts. And there's a, the University of Minnesota has somebody who's big in. I mean, we, we're we're t we, we're participating in that as an institution of, of learning. All of the practices. The thing that is important about not essentializing Native Americans is it's not about beads and baskets. However beautiful the beads and baskets are, and however important the beads and baskets are, that's not what I, all I need to know is go to a museum and say, ah, look at the beautiful bead and basket. I need to think about Franklin Avenue in Minneapolis, and I'm sure there's similar places in St. Paul that I don't know about where individual people, when I was little and we drove in the country, there were all these stores for, that were only for white people, and many of them had a figure in the front who was clearly some kind of Native American, and it said, the, the thing always said the same thing, the only good engine, I-N-J-U-N, is a dead engine. But some of this museum thing that glorifies the beads and the baskets, it's just a more sophisticated version of the only good engine is a dead engine. We love them in the museum, but how about Franklin Avenue? You know, how, how, how about that? Um, so if you could help your students begin to think of two sins rather than one sin, I think that would be helpful. And then begin to help them after you find some of these sources you can begin to incorporate some of that. I mean, they don't need to read Roxana Dunbar or Ortiz. Yeah. Well, last week I went to the Minnesota Indian Education Association conference, and um, Ortiz's book 
Oh. And Indigenous Peoples History of the United States. Yes. They've released a young people, a young readers edition. Oh, wonderful. with the help of I had to look up the name Debbie Reese and Jean Mendoza. Okay. And so they adapted it for high school age students to read. So it's very approachable. And they added a bunch of new chapters about land oh. rights and missing and murdered Indigenous women oh, and water. Oh. So it's it's really really good if anyone wants. It's called okay. Indigenous People's History of the United States. And look up the one for young people. Right. Because the other one is. Did everybody you know, get the title? Indigenous People's History, people's history of, of the United, United States. States. Yeah, that's the title. Excellent. That, that Carol Miller just told me that. I didn't write it down. Wonderful. Yeah. But how wonderful that they've done a, I mean, that somebody's taken that and made it something for, for people. It's, it's like In Search of the Mother Tree <clears throat> that's yeah. being written for people like me to learn about how trees talk to each other. and help their children and send water to their drive members and stuff like that. Anyway, okay. Um, do I want to say anything else? I guess I don't want to say anything else. <laughs> I think I'll say anything else. Thank you for listening. <laughs>